One of the greatest challenges of data management is balancing the needs of security and access to data. For the longest time, we've encrypted data to keep anyone from seeing it, whether it's moving across the wire or at rest on a storage system. But before we can do any processing, we have to decrypt that data, and that opens the door for somebody to snoop and see what it is. Now, imagine if there was ability to process encrypted data without ever decrypting it. That's homomorphic encryption, and that's what we're going to talk about on this Gestalt IT roundtable. Here's an example. Let's say that I was uh, voting and I uh, wanted to make sure that no one could see what my vote was, but I still wanted it to count. Wouldn't it be amazing if your vote could be counted without ever opening the envelope? It, with homomorphic encryption, something like that could actually be a reality because it allows us to process encrypted data and do simple or even more complex math functions on it. This has been a dream for a long time, but it's starting to get real. And that's what we're talking about today with Intel. I am Flavio Bergamaschi. Hello, everybody. I am the lead technologist for home of encryption at Intel. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. My name is Fabian Burma. Uh, I work at Intel. I'm the tech lead for Intel Hexel, which is our homomorphic encryption acceleration library. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott Bollinger. You can find me on Twitter at KFalconSPB. Hi, I'm Zoe Rose. Uh, I'm a information security lead for the region um, at Canon EMEA, and you can follow me on Twitter at RoseSecOps. As someone who's been involved in data management and storage for a long time, I can tell you that one of the biggest challenges for us is maintaining control of data, even though it can be moved and copied and moved around everywhere without uh, you know, encryption applied to it. The problem is that once we've encrypted data, it's kind of stuck. You can't do anything with it. But homomorphic encryption promises to break this stranglehold. Theoretically, it would allow us to process data while it's still encrypted. That's right, we're not decrypting it. We're not even decrypting it right close to the processing. We're leaving it encrypted and processing it anyway. This sounds like magic. Flavio, can you give us a little bit of a sense of, of how is this even possible? Homomorphic encryption is, is, is an interesting encryption. It, um, as you mentioned, it allows you to process data while it's in, encrypted. So we, we tend to say that um, it uh, allows the delegation of the processing of the data without giving the access to it. So and this is kind of a, a very strong phrase because when you say without giving access to it, it means that it's not in a form that it can be easily uh, seen or observed, but you can still compute on it, right? And uh, it's important to, 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 to remember that homomorphic encryption is also, uh, it's based on lattice cryptography and consider quantum resistant. A quantum resistant means that today we don't know of any quantum algorithm that can break this cryptography with any less complexity than a normal computer. But it also, this encrypted encryption, it's, there's another fact to it, which is it changes the, the security paradigm. The crypto is embedded in the business logic now. It's not something separate from the business logic. And uh, with that, we can look at several scenarios where uh, we can use this um, type of cryptography. The typical scenarios um, that, uh, that we look at are basically we try to break into three big categories or archetypes, as we say it, queries, um, extracting value from private and confidential, confidential data, basically machine learning, and uh, secure outsourcing combined with secure insourcing. And uh, as we go through this conversation, we will describe this in more details. Okay, so one thing I was thinking is um, in the use case of like, uh can't say it right, the scrims too, and SEC, this would probably, would this be something that um, would support that, i.e. Uh, data processing in third countries outside the EU? Homomorphic encryption will 
assist with complying uh, with the regulations. Uh, now, the regulations are the ones that are going to specify where the data has to reside, right? So we can uh, mm -hmm. we can say that uh, uh, home office encryption is not a way to avoid regulations; is a way to comply with regulations. So, do you anticipate the laws to catch up uh, with the technology then? Because right now, it's it's assuming that you could read it in whatever country it's 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 in. That that's a good point. Um, Home office encryption addresses a very specific threat model, and that's a good thing to to, to talk about because is uh, the threat model of um, honest but curious adversary, which basically means that uh, we prevent the entity performing the computation, which is totally um, allowed and part of that computation, of seeing the data in its clear form. And uh, that would be uh, observing the data for whatever reason, maybe to exfiltrate data, maybe to learn about uh, the data that it's processing. So it assumes that the computation is performed honestly, but the, the, the process or the data process or such is curious in learning from from that computation, so that that's what homomorphic encryption addresses. Um, whether the laws and regulations are going to work uh, with it, and or I wouldn't say that it has necessarily to catch up because there are several initiatives right now on how to deploy um, technologies that are privacy preserving. And uh, recently, the UK government released a paper. On um, on precisely that um, that aspect. Yeah, I think what, one important aspect to mention here in terms of laws catching up with the technology is the standardization process of AG. So today, most AG schemes are not standardized. The Palier encryption system is the one exception. So you say the use case of honest but curious, but in in the case of um, also, you know, a malicious actor, maybe in already in a system that is using doing their data processing whilst it's encrypted. In that case, you would also obviously still want a more in depth solution as well, not just this, but you'd want to add on. Uh, yes, that's a good point. The what what happens in those scenarios will be that the computation is still uh, not observable because it's done encrypted, but uh, a malicious adversary could corrupt the computation or alter the computation in ways to um, instigate the user to ask again and so on, and therefore creating potential side channels for attacking. So in that context, uh, we have the other technologies that we use today for protecting uh, those aspects of the, of the uh, workflow, let's put it this way. Um, but it, it's it's a good point because it's important that uh, whenever you deploy security technologies, or morphic encryption being one of them, that you analyze the entire risk uh, that is involved in that computation and pick the right tool to protect different aspects of the threat that exists. And uh, which leads me back to standards because a part of uh, what the standards provide are the compliance and robustness rules for any given technology, right? Which is how to use it in a safe way. Um, Flavio, you bring up a, a, a good point of, of resources. Can you speak to like how many additional resources or what kind of hit we're gonna be taking on the infrastructure side? Well, the answer for whenever someone asks about how, how much resources people you're going to need is depends, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Dep depends very much on the use case because uh, home office encryption uh, provides you with um, the basic the, the basic tools that home office encryption provides is multiplications and additions done uh, homomorphically in an encrypted form. Right, and if you ask any mathematician, if you can do multiplications and additions, you can do pretty much everything, right? 
Uh, so w those are the, if you think, the assembler instructions for everything you do, right? So if you're doing, let's say, some machine learning inference, you're going to be doing uh, performing a matrix operation followed by some sort of activation function, right? It's a very what we call shallow computation because it's one multiplication followed by the activation function. If you're going to be doing training, is a lot of multiplications <laughs> and a lot of activation functions. So depending on um, on the use case, you need more or or less resources. Uh, and that we without without looking at the use case and the, the data and the data structures is uh, it's just a guess uh, with x uh, pu um, um, support does that mean currently you're expecting um, apologies if this is a silly question but does that mean currently you're expecting like one system is able to do the data processing and then you'll have you know it can work with multiple systems to do it so it'd be a less of a load on one system is am i understanding that right or am i wrong in that the the inform the technology is evolving so the hardware technology is evolving and the algorithms are evolving and so on and what you what we try to do is to map and tune the algorithms for different hardware and more advanced hardware that's coming down the pipeline Right. So the XPU is a kind of a, a generic term knowledge for an accelerator processing unit that we that uh, we will have at some point, right? And when that that is available, uh, then the algorithms will be mapped and tuned for that. And uh, the work that uh, Fabian does is precisely that on the on the tuning, and he can he can say more about it. Sure, yeah, at, at Intel, I'm, I mean, I'm the technical lead for the Intel Hexel library, which is the homomorphic encryption acceleration library. So what this is, is a um, C++ library, uh, which aims to optimize the homomorphic encryption kernels on uh, Intel platforms. So today we support the uh, Intel Xeon platform line with the AVX 512 instruction set. In particular, Intel announced this year the third generation Intel Xeon processor scalable family. Uh, code name Ice Lake, and in particular, Intel Hexel takes advantage of a specific IFMA 52 instruction therein uh, to accelerate homomorphic encryption. I think, in in general, how I see it, it's in terms of how many hardware resources are required. And this was referring to Scott's question earlier. It's it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. It's like today we don't have many use cases for which HE is fast enough to support. So as hardware um, like it has, as hardware acceleration uh, matures, we'll be able to just support a wider variety of use cases and need fewer resources per use case, but larger use cases will end up requiring more resources as a result. Um, I'd like to point out the uh, DPRIVE program, which is a DARPA, so Advanced Research Project um, by the Department of Defense. The goal of the DARPA DPRIVE project is to accelerate homomorphic encryption via a custom hardware, a custom ASIC. The goal is to accelerate HE by about 10,000 X compared to the current uh, baseline. So we're, we're really excited about um, the potential new use cases this will unlock. Lovely. Um, so in, in that case, looking at kind of the limitations, I, I believe I remember uh, either read or spoke to you guys, I think recently, is there any other kind of limitations or, or maybe um, things that we need to expect if we were wanting to make use of it. So onboarding into our, our system, i.e., you know, we need the hardware or maybe we can use the cloud provider, but it has to be, again, specific hardware in the cloud provider, for example. Sure, so Intel Hexel is, um, performs best on hardware with the AVX 512 instruction set. So that's re recent uh, Intel hardware from the past uh, few years, but it also supports uh, just a normal C++ implementation that runs on any hardware. You just won't get the best performance. Uh, well, one thing to point out actually is that we've integrated Intel Hexel with the Microsoft Seal and Palisade homomorphic encryption libraries. So it's really easy to use. Just check out their uh, readme files for instructions to do so. The, the other aspect on the, the use cases that you, that you mentioned so is that people, people always ask, what's the killer app? 
for homomorphic encryption, right? So, and I then say, the killer app has not yet been kind of invented because it's new to people. There are There is a plethora of use cases that we expect will come when people start to accept that they can actually share data in a secure way. Uh, because there are several scenarios or user scenarios that were never even considered because sharing of data was a no, 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 I'm, never, I'm not going to give you my data, period. Right? And now I say, no, I can give you my data. And I say, well, but yeah, what can we do with that? <laughs> right? So people are still coming to terms with that. And, uh, and the new use cases are coming. So although homomorphic encryption is um, quite compute intensive, we, we tend to say that we are at the, the inflection point because there are plenty of scenarios and use cases that uh, homomorphic encryption can be used today uh, with a good performance, particularly those that are batch operations. So if I'm going to come, if I'm going to put my data to be processed now, but I'm only going to consume the result tomorrow, and if the processing that uh, would have taken, let's say, an hour, now takes eight hours. It really doesn't matter because it's only tomorrow that I'm going to do uh, something with it, right? Uh, and this is this is important to consider. I think the example that you had given on on uh, the use of a, a an address or a mobile locating device on a for like a Google or Maps really hit home to me as an individual user because. Uh, a lot of what you're describing is stuff that people would never see. Um, can you kind of describe that again, or? Oh, sure. Uh, so what we, so that, that that's that's a good uh, way of talking about the archetypes and being more specific about that. So uh, queries. So let, let's let's have a chat about queries. Whenever whenever someone asks a question, you review intent in one way or another. Right, and when you're reviewing intent, you are revealing, you are leaking something to the other party. That can be what you know, what you want to know, and so on. In the in the oblivious query scenario, uh, let's take the example that it resonates with, more with people, which is you want to ask your um, virtual assistant that in somewhere in the cloud you don't know where, right? For um, where is the where is the next petrol station, or where is the next? Uh, how do I go from home to work, or whether I want to stop for, for coffee in a bit? So people don't realize how much private information you are giving out, right? Uh, and uh, you are giving where you're starting your journey, where your destination is, what time of the day it is, that you intend to stop. <laughs> or do you intend to stop many times during your journey? Uh, if you could ask that, which you can homomorphically, the service could still be processed, could still give you uh, the information about traffic, about stops, where the coffee shop or petrol station, without knowing what, uh, what it gave you, what it respond to you, but you could decrypt and uh, on your device, and, and follow that. So that, that's a, and this leads into several other aspects of uh, obliviousness when you ask a question like a private information retrieval. So you want to, to ask for something, <laughs> right? Retrieve that without saying what you were retrieving. And uh, which leads into other more interesting um, operations over queries, which are the private set operations on queries, how to compute the intersection, the union, exception. So as you can see that all these things can be, are the building blocks for applications that are, that are more complex, right? Membership of a, of a given set of those, uh, which are important. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good example, actually, because that, that's pretty much yeah, that, that goes to pretty much what I kind of look for is how can we do things but privately, you know, privacy is so important, um, especially now with all data being so valuable. Um, one, one question that I had um, 
was, uh, and I think you kind of touched on it, but um, how homo homomorphic encryption collaborates with the confidential computing. I think you kind of already covered, um, obviously, uh, protecting privacy, but also looking at, you know, is this could we consider it as a solution to um, the end-to-end um, -end encryption debate um, where, you know, nations want to put backdoors into things, it kind of removes their ability to. So would that, in your mind, would that be a solution or is this still something we've got to work towards? I, uh, people talk about end-to-end -end encryption. Um, the chromorphic encryption is, is uh, people, people also talk about it on end-to-end -end encryption. It's not kind of end-to-end. But uh, but uh, in that context, I think homomorphic encryption is is one of the tools in our toolbox to address privacy concerns. It's not this tool or another tool. Is uh, going back to analyzing the risk of any given solution. Is what are the right technologies that you may need to combine to prevent leakage of information, right? But you can't do that unless you analyze the threats that you want to prevent, I guess. And then you can pick the right technology. You, can be, you could be using home of encryption in combination with trusted execution environments or using uh, federated learning or other techniques in conjunction to enhance the, pri the overall privacy of uh, of the application, of the data, actually. That's a great point, Flavio, with the different uh, privacy-preserving machine learning technologies that have to come together to build a solution. I, I think that's absolutely right. You know, HE itself is just a building block. It has several weaknesses, and in particular, usually HE schemes support only additions and multiplications. So if you want to deploy any sort of machine learning model, you need a comparison operator, and that's, that's quite difficult to do in most HE schemes. So if you have multi-party computation, which supports these comparison operators, it's a very natural uh, way to trade off parts of the computation between HE and MPC. Or another example is in federated learning, you have, you know, you're training a machine learning model distributed across uh, many often mobile devices. The mobile devices send the model updates to a central aggregator who uh, combines the, the model updates. In this case, the, the model updates may actually leak some information about the underlying data that was used on each personal device. So you can use uh, HE to protect that aggregation and, and therefore provide additional security or privacy to the, to the mobile devices. Um, so, so going back to kind of the implementing in our environment, if theoretically we've got the use case, we've got a threat map, we know, yes, this is the right solution. Um, currently, would it be, uh, there are obviously quite a few limitations in the you know, you send it overnight and deal with it tomorrow, but but um, things are like onboarding into our infrastructure. Is this something that I would expect, you know, a lot of training or, you know, is it high? I assume it's pretty specialized, uh, but is there kind of, I know you have a GitHub. So if I were to go there and I would learn about it, read your documentation and read me and all of that, then theoretically I should be able to implement this today or is this still kind of a in progress Thing? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think the currently one of the main limitations for HE adoption is the lack of sort of widespread, easy to use infrastructure. So in particular, you know how for deep learning you have TensorFlow or, or PyTorch, you, you don't have TensorFlow that works with HE. You have a few research projects, but there's no sort of mature solution for uh, industry deployment today. So certainly, HE libraries have made, a, made it much easier for the sort of layperson to learn about HE. Nevertheless, adopting HE solutions still requires a huge amount of expertise in HE, and uh, key management is also missing. So there's a lot, lot of work still required, I would say, before it's, it's available to the common person. Uh, on the other hand, you know, something like HTTPS, the common person doesn't need to know anything about the security behind it. it just needs, it's up to sort of the the providers for the, this should, there should only be a small set of people working with HE and make it easy to use and transparent for the rest of the users. Um, however, HE does have its own difficulties. In, in particular, if you're trying to deploy HE and trying to debug why something goes wrong, it, the data is encrypted, it's, it's very difficult. You can't just print out what, what, what's going on. Um, 
you know, this, this is a common problem, I would say, among uh, just technology in general when you're trying to access private data. You know, currently, maybe you have to file a special access request, but if it's encrypted, you, you can't really do that. So kind of brings it back around to the conversation you were talking about earlier about standardization with ISO and stuff. How far off do you think that that is realistically as far as the standards? Well, that, that's a good question. <laughs> that's another good question. The, the standards are, uh, are in discussions. There are drafts and so on. But when you standardize home of encryption, is, uh, the question is, what are we standardizing? The one aspect of it is the security. How, how do you define the security, the security levels, or what are the parameters that provide a secure environment for uh, home of encryption? That, that's one part. Uh, the other part is when you talk about uh, the schemes. So there are different schemes. And just to, to cite a few, there is BGV, BFV, CKKS. So most of these schemes, by the way, the acronym of the scheme is based on the surname of the people that invented those, <laughs> right? <laughs> So these are the initials of the surnames of the, the, the persons. Um, many, of those, many of those are colleagues of ours that are people that, uh, that, uh, that we met. So, but to, to, to take that is the, the standards will help. And the standards will bring uh, also the, as I mentioned before, the how to comply and how to safely deploy and use home of encryption in a given environment. The standards will not define how the SDK or the development environment is going to be, right? So standards help adoption because then uh, companies and users say, well, it's a standard, I can adopt that because somebody took care of looking, looking for all the possible problems. But still, you need a software development kit if you want to program on that. Today, the best way to, to develop a Form of encryption is you have to get someone that is an expert in high performance computing, in cryptography, good mathematician, and OC++ very well. <laughs> right? Plus the line of business that know what the problem is that he wants to resolve. Right. So it is it is involving. Let's put it very involving. Um, but the community and uh, and the companies like ourselves are trying to make this to lower the entry level, right? With more examples, with two kits, with kind of a one button install. So instead of having to go to GitHub and download three, four, 10 different libraries to build and install now, you can download the toolkit, say build. And uh, at the end of the process, you have something that you can experiment with. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the level we are right now. There are uh, companies and startups and the providers that provide solutions, turnkey solutions for using home of encryption, right? So, uh, and, the, and the customers can go and, and, uh, and buy that. But again, it's, it's a turnkey solution. So because you are still in that piloting phase, trying to learn and so on, um, many of the users wanted to know more about the the inner workings of uh, of the technology ahead of deploying it um, before just buying uh, a solution. I guess uh, in that scenario also because the lack of standards. So if there is a standards and someone says I comply with these standards being verified and so on, that would facilitate the the process. So just to take this uh, home, um, if you took off your you know, Intel hat and just think of, of it as a researcher, um, in 30 years or in 40 years, are we going to have a lot of data encrypted throughout processing? Or is this going to remain a very specific tool for very specific needs? Is this going to be widespread or, or just a small subset of data? Personally, uh, without any hat, then I, I would expect that most of the processing will be done in an encrypted form. Right, because uh, more and more 
data is private or sensitive data. We, we uh, people don't realize how much you give away of your, your own privacy, your own life, just for the sake of getting a service, right? And, uh, and uh, when, when people start realizing and demanding more of, uh, of, uh, of the privacy, then uh, you see the offering of services that are privacy preserving to, to, to become more. And actually, we are seeing some of that. We have uh, spoken to colleagues and to customers, actually, that they don't have an explicit um, need for home off encryption today because their regulation allows them to do what they want to do. But because they want to be social uh, conscious and provide a privacy environment, an environment where they can preserve privacy, they're already looking at technologies that can can offer that. So it's kind of a it's a market demand now, right? Because if you are if you are uh, social conscious and, uh, and and everything else, that that that's a way to gain market. Well, thank you very much for this look into homomorphic encryption. I really appreciate the uh, questions as well. Um, where can we connect with you and learn more and follow your thoughts on this technology? Let's start with Zoe. Yeah, so you can. I guess connect with me on Twitter, uh, so at RoseCOps, uh, or on my uh, personal blog is just rosec.com. And with me, um, you can connect with me on Twitter at KFalcon SPB, or on my personal blog Scott-Bollinger.com. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can just search my name; you'll find me. Yeah, the same. The same for me. You can you can reach out on LinkedIn, uh, and uh, please visit um, Intel's. Home of encryption toolkit if you want to play with it. Well, thanks so much for this insight. Uh, it really is uh, quite a remarkable technology that, uh, you know, that we like to say that technology sometimes feels like magic. Uh, being able to process data without decrypting it definitely feels like magic. So it's really interesting to learn that this is uh, the real deal. So for me, Stephen Foskett from Gestalt IT, and from all of us here, thank you so much for joining us today, Flavio and Fabian, Zoe and Scott. And we look forward to learning more about this technology and other technology at gestaltit.com.